Welcome to episode 80 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes and in a few moments we're going to be heading to York to have a chat with Rob Ainsley. He's appeared on the podcast before. He's the man who makes the music that you're currently listening to and he's going to be talking to us about cycling the way of the roses 1970s style. But before we go over to York, a reminder, if you'd like to get in contact with the podcast, visit cyclingeurope.org forward slash contact and if you'd like to help support the podcast then visit cyclingeurope.org forward slash support so without further ado i asked rob to begin by introducing himself Hello, uh, my name's Rob Ainsley. I'm a cycle writer and I live in York. And uh, basically my job consists of riding to obscure places and then writing bad jokes about them. And a couple of months ago I did a bike ride that took me back in time when I rode the Way of the Roses from Morecambe to Bridlington, 170 miles across northern England, on a 1979 bike and with only 1970s kit. And of course, you are the person who produces the music for this podcast, um, which I very often forget to credit you for. So before we go any further, thank you for producing the music. Thank you for writing, performing the music that uh, continues to appear at the beginning and end of these, uh, of these podcasts. Are you, are you still busy with the music? I haven't done any writing for about a year and I'm hoping to get back to that but I've just been rather too busy cycling. Yeah because apart from the 1970s cycle that you're going to be talking about you've obviously continuing to do your end-to-end trips um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to to talk about the ones that you've done recently but just to kind of wet, wet our appetite which ones have you done most recently? So yes, I collect international end-to-ends and I've done about two dozen countries so far. The last couple that I did were Latvia, Luxembourg and Denmark, which I've just come back from. And in a few days' time, I'll be off to do Switzerland. Right, OK, so we'll catch up about those in a bit. Uh, we're sitting in Cycle Heaven in York, which is where you live. Well, not in the bike shop but in the in the, <laughs> it feels like it sometimes. <laughs> in the in the in the city of York um, hence the uh, the background noise of um, coffee being made etc what gave you the original idea to set off and cycle 1970s style um, the 1970s let's face it doesn't have a great reputation when you look back at all the decades of the 20th century I think probably the 1970s with the exception perhaps of the 1940s, might be down there at the bottom of the list. It doesn't have a great reputation. It's thought of as the naffest decade in, in recent uh, times. It certainly was a time of power cuts, of strikes, of rampant inflation, a lot of casual racism and sexism. Uh, but then on the other hand, there were things that we'd like to get back. You could. A, um, a family with just a single wage earner on an average wage could afford a three bedroom semi and uh, job security was much better than it is now you didn't have to work on social hours so uh, yeah it was a different time but uh, in some ways it can be unfairly maligned right okay so and it also crucially for you it was the first, it was the decade when you first set off on a on a cycle tour uh, that's right. For me, I was a teenager in the 70s, so a lot of formative experiences, such as the first job, first sacking, all that kind of thing. And in January 1979, I got my first proper bike, a rally clubman, and went on my first bike tour with a friend of mine. We rode from Hull to York, stayed on a barge in Selby, met a magician, it threw it down with rain. And I just remember thinking, this is just brilliant. This is such such a great way to spend the time, the sense of freedom, the sense of excitement and exploration. And I've been cycle touring ever since. So you've decided to go on this 1970s style cycle tour. In preparing for the ride, I mean, clearly, it's easy to not take a mobile phone. It's easy not to use the internet uh, while you're cycling. 
but presumably you had to buy some 1970s style kit and equipment. Um, how easy was that? Well, the first thing was the bike, and it started because I got an email from a magazine I write for saying, Rob, do you have a vintage bike? And this is a bit like if you're an actor and your agent says, can you ride a horse? Of course you're going to say yes, because there's a part in it. So I knew that there was some work in this somewhere. So, of course, I, I, I wouldn't lie. My mum told me never to lie. She said, if you lie, Santa Claus won't come. And so I told the truth and I said... Funnily enough, I'm thinking of buying a vintage bike, which was true. It hadn't been true five minutes before, but it was true now. So uh, there was another article in it somewhere, um, but I needed a vintage bike. So I did the usual thing, looked at eBay, Gumtree and so on. Uh, found a bike from a bike recycling charity called Resurrection Bikes of Harrogate. And they take donated bikes, fix them up, and sell them for various charitable causes. It's, it's all good stuff and your money's going to help disadvantaged people in countries like Ukraine and Peru and England. And I test drove a few bikes and just fell in love with this Claude Bottler. It was clearly a 1970s bike, a, a fast tourer, and took it home. And when I got it back home, I looked online and found it had actually been made in January 1979, which was the same month I started Cycle 2. So that set me thinking, could I rediscover some of that excitement of 1970s touring? So that's where the idea all came from. Can I just ask you about the bike? I mean, you, you've, you've talked there about how you actually managed to get hold of a, a vintage bike, um, but increasingly there are lots of events, uh, both in Britain and abroad, um, quite high profile events where cyclists are required to get hold of and cycle at this particular event a vintage bike so is actually there a, is there a growing demand for them and have they become quite expensive to get hold of it varies the bike I bought was 150 pounds which seemed pretty good value because in its day it was a very good bike it would have cost about 170 pounds in 1979 at the time that was equivalent to about 350 pints of guinness in a pub 150 pounds now is what about 25 or 30 pints of guinness something like that so it was a bargain and it was in very good nick it didn't need anything doing to it it rides beautifully it's it's a really nice bike to ride. Comfy, you can ride it all day, it's, it's, it's lithe and it's fast and it's graceful. But the people who, who take part in these events like Velo Retro, I know there's one in France called uh, Anjou Velo something, there's one, there's the famous one in Italy, the Eroica Festival. The people who take part in those, they do have some beautiful old vintage bikes and presumably they do cost a lot of money. They certainly can, and if you look online, you can see the websites of various professional restorers who make fantastic jobs of meticulously recreating 1950s classic Italian races. And sure, they can cost two, three, four, five, six, seven thousand pounds uh, and more. And how many? How many pints of Guinness is that? <laughs> they're probably enough to last me a year. Um, and yeah, at events like Velo Retro, which I just. Uh, visited last weekend, I was covering it for a, a magazine, you see a whole range of bikes from old rallies that have just been in somebody's garage for 30 years to some of these fantastically recreated masterpieces from the classic era of Italian racing, which yes, would cost as much as a, as a decent car. So you've got your 150 quid uh, 1979 Claude Butler. Um, was it ex did you keep it exactly as it was made in 1979 or did you did you have any uh, did you were you required to change anything or modernize anything i didn't have to do anything to it uh, the rack was still original but i actually got a saddlebag from caradice of nelson the famous traditional luggage makers uh, they very kindly gave me a large saddlebag which just looks great on the bike at some point, somebody had changed the double cassette at the front to a triple, uh, sorry, the double chainring at the front to a triple chainring, which made it a bit easier up the hills. Uh, I think it had modern tyres, but everything else was pretty much original and it was still in great working order. So 
I put out an appeal uh, to friends on Facebook and that sort of thing, saying, does everyone ha any, anyone have any 70s kit they could lend me? And it was really easy. Clearly a lot of people had this stuff just sitting around in their garage and they were delighted to lend it to me. So, uh, for example, I got um, a rain cape, these traditional rain capes that are like a caftan uh, that covers the handlebars and, and all of you and it's just got a hole that your head goes through. And I used that on the way of the Roses trip uh, and it was surprisingly effective actually for old equipment. I got some vintage lights and... Yeah, the, the, I saw a picture of these at the, at the Cycle Touring Festival and they were by far my favourite bit of the <laughs> yes. kit because I had exactly the same ones and I would imagine most people who cycled in the 70s and early 80s had these lights. Yes, and it's this interesting contrast. Whereas bikes, yeah, bikes have changed a bit, but basically your 1970s bike, if it was a decent bike to start with, still rides beautifully. It handles a little bit differently, but it's still a delight to ride. But those old lights, they were terrible. The front light, which I'm sure many people remember, it was the size of a house brick. It took two batteries that were like the size of baked bean tins and the same weight. And you got about half an hour of flickering candlelight if you were lucky. And very often when I've been out on my bike, people have stopped me uh, just to talk about the lights. They go, oh, I remember those lights. I had some of those. Terrible they were. And that's an aspect of cycling that has got so much better because, as we know, modern lights, they're inexpensive, they're efficient, they, they illuminate really well, they last for ages on a recharge or on a set of batteries. So I certainly wouldn't go back to the old lights. Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, you could argue that the modern bike lights are probably over-engineered in terms of the, the amount of brightness that they give you. You can get a thousand lumens and that seems phenomenal. I remember seeing the first modern or using the first modern bike light that I bought well, 10, 15 years ago. And the, the chap who sold me it in the, uh, in the bike shop down in Caversham, he took me into a dark alley next to the uh, bike shop and, and switched this thing on. And I was just amazed as to, as to how bright it actually was. So I think there's an argument there that we might have gone a bit too far now in terms of what actually is required by your average cyclist in terms of a, a bike light, but certainly not. I, I'm not advocating going back to a 1970s ever-ready uh, lamp. Well, yes, some of them are, are like the illumination at a rock stadium concert. Um, so, yes, they can be a bit over the top and it can be a bit blinding when people are coming towards you. And uh, what else did I get? Um, I got some vintage maps and also I got a, a 1970s camera because I was quite keen to do what I did in the 1970s which was take pictures on an old 35mm SLR using black and white film and I did take some black and white pictures and uh, they've some of them are, are, uh, appear in the article in Cycle magazine that we're about to talk about. And, and that was fun, and it's, it was a bit of a surprise to find that black and white film is still a thing. You can still buy it, you can still get it developed. It works out really expensive. It works out about a pound per print. And so that means you have to really think about your pictures, you have to plan ahead. You can't just snap away like we're used to now. You can just take video and pictures, and, and you might take a hundred in a day and look through and choose the three or four that you like best. It's not like that with a traditional old camera. Um, and, but it was quite fun rediscovering those old techniques that I remember using in the 70s. And, and I, I was quite pleased with some of the results. I would imagine most people nowadays would struggle to actually work a, an old-style film SLR, bearing in mind that you know the concepts of stop numbers and apertures and film speeds, they, will, they do appear on your mobile phone, but people don't really appreciate what they are because uh, they're no longer really, it's all automatic and uh, you never have to really set them. Whereas back on an old style SLR from the 70s, you really have to think quite carefully about how bright it was, uh, what you were photographing, the depth of field, things like that. Um, I mean, I'm guessing that that wasn't an issue for you. Uh, I, that's right, I was using uh, a Pentax K1000, which was a classic student camera of the time, lent to me by an artist friend. And yes, it was that 
old traditional stuff of you had a light meter reading, you then had to decide which f-stop and which shutter speed, uh, you then had to uh, focus and it might well take you 30 seconds or a minute to, to get a shot ready. So it wasn't point and shoot, certainly. But then on the other hand, it does force you to think carefully about the shot. So yeah, you, you can still get some good results. And the maps, you took Bartholomew half-inch maps, which I recognise, and when I saw them at the Cycle Touring Festival, I thought, oh yeah, my dad used to have loads of those. In fact, I think I still have, because I, 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 I now have all these old maps. Um, I've never really looked at them in any kind of detail um, for a long, long time, because I think nowadays most people, if they're going to buy a map, they tend to buy the Ordnance Survey map. Um, were they any good? They actually weren't quite as bad as I'd feared. The advantage of Bartholomew's maps, I was told by club cyclists of, of the time, was that they were just the right scale for a day trip. They were sort of okay, uh, but I still prefer OS maps, which is what I used in the 70s, and I still tend to be a paper map sort of person. Of course, I've got an app on my phone usually that shows me where I am. It's, it's very reassuring to have that little blue dot that uh, tells you exactly where you are in that suburb of France or that remote country junction. But for me, OS maps are still the ones that give me a, a feel for the landscape I'm going through and allow me to understand and appreciate everything that's around me, rather than just following an arrow telling me where to go. Yeah, I think it's that aspect of, of knowing what's to the left and what's to the right. You don't necessarily have a plan to go there, but it's nice to know what's there. In the next valley, which you don't obviously get if you're just looking at quite a phone-sized snapshot on Google Maps. But anyway, that's a, another discussion altogether. Right, so you've got your equipment, um, and how did you decide what route to take? I wanted something achievable, because I wasn't really sure how many days the Claude Butler might stay in good nick. Uh, so I thought something that was about three, four days would feel about right and I've done the Way of the Roses a couple of times on other bikes and I've done pretty much all of the bits of it several times on other rides. But that seemed the right sort of challenge. It was easy to do, easy to get to from my home which is in York. One of the nights I could actually stay at home so it was all logistically very straightforward and it's just a great ride as, as you know. So can you, can you just say where it starts and where it finishes? So the Way of the Roses is 170 mile coast to coast across northern England from Morecambe on the west coast near Lancaster through York to Bridlington on the east coast. Most of it's in Yorkshire and it goes through Lancaster and York which of course are associated with the houses of Lancaster and York, the Wars of the Roses. Yeah, I remember when I did it a few years ago, I, I was amazed by the Loon Valley, that first bit when you come out of uh, Morecambe and you've been through Lancaster and then there's this long valley heading in the direction of Yorkshire and I really wasn't expecting that at all. It was a really beautiful, bucolic even valley um, that you follow as you make your way in the direction of, of Yorkshire. Yes, it's quite a surprise because you're dead flat, you're along rail trails, basically Morecambe to Lancaster, you come east out of Lancaster for about four or five miles, and then suddenly you get to a viewpoint called the Crook of Loon, and there's a little few picnic benches, and you get this view up the Loon Valley, and you suddenly get a feeling for what's about to happen for the next few days. And that was where I first had my first challenge coming out of there. There was a road closure with no diversions signposted and uh, not having access to the, the quick uh, fix of an app telling me where I was. I was dependent on the maps and I was stood there trying to make head or tail of the Bartholomew maps and I was rescued by a local cyclist, uh, a really nice guy just out for a ride. He didn't know about the road closure either but he knew the roads and so he showed me a little back street diversion down little farm lanes and uh, over the river and got us back onto the route and 
we sat and had a chat and a little picnic in the village of Hornby, which has a little village shop, and we just sat outside and had a pork pie and a can of fizzy drink. And that was when I thought, yeah, this trip is going to work because this is just the sort of traditional thing that we like to think of as, an, as a timeless aspect of cycle touring. The serendipitous little meeting and all very pleasant. You have a little chat and then you both go on your way. And uh, that, was, that, that made me think, yeah, I'm going to enjoy this. Can I just pick up on something you said there? You said that you didn't have access to your app on your phone to find out where you were. Did you actually take a, a modern smartphone with you? And if you did, how close did you get to ever using it? I did have a phone with me, which I kept off most of the time uh, for various reasons. I had to stay in phone contact with people back home. Uh, so, yeah, in the evenings I was certainly consulting it. I also had uh, a modern digital camera because I was doing this for a magazine article, so I needed some colour photos as well. So I did end up having a bit of modern gear, and, yeah, it's really hard not to use these things. We get so used to using it. So, yeah, it wasn't completely pure. It wasn't 100% uh, technological austerity. So when you were standing at that road thinking, where the hell am I going to go, before this nice chap turned up, how close were you to whipping out the phone and looking on Google Maps? The fingers were twitching. <laughs> right, OK. Now, accommodation. Um, you didn't camp, and that's kind of a, perhaps the next question, but... Uh, how did you sort out the accommodation, bearing in mind that, well, did you plan it all in advance? Had you rung ahead before you set off on a landline, presumably, rather than your mobile phone from home? Um, or was it all ad hoc? I wanted to do it ad hoc because, certainly when I started touring in the 70s, from what I remember, we didn't set anything up in advance. You just turned up. When it got to about five o'clock, you'd start looking around for a and b or look for a tourist information office or just go to a youth hostel and just turn up. So I wanted to stick as close as I could to that. So I got on the end of the first day to settle and it was throwing it down with rain and it was about four o'clock and I thought, I'm ready to stop now. So I couldn't see any B&Bs. Uh, the tourist office was closed, as many are nowadays. Uh, there's just not the funding. Ones that are still open are often run by volunteers, so it's unreliable opening hours. So I went into the local bike shop, Three Peak Cycles, uh, which I've been in before, and they were, they were great. They said, ah, yeah, you know, there's a guest house just down the road. Or they said you could try the youth hostel at Malham, which I did know about. It's about five miles further on. The guest house did have a space, but it was a bit beyond my budget. So I thought I'd chance it and ride on to Malham Youth Hostel uh, because I knew that in term time they are more likely to have spaces than in holiday time when they have school groups in. So I cycled on through the rain and surprise surprise they had a dorm bed for £15. Thanks to flexible pricing, dynamic pricing, uh, because they just happened to have a space left. If I'd gone the week before, it would have been £35, they told me. So that was a victory for turning up at the last minute, but there was certainly a sense of relief. And it was a really pleasant evening in the youth hostel. Uh, they can be delightful places to stay, swapping travellers' tales in the common room and the youth hostel kitchen, and uh, that, that was a really nice evening. Um, yeah, I, I, I stayed at Malham Youth Hostel a few years ago. And I stayed in one of those pods outside, uh, which was quite nice, until the heater broke. Um, but it was quite nice. But you're right about that communal. There is a really nice communal area uh, in Malham Youth Hostel. And I, th I seem to remember, because of the nature of Malham Dale, you don't actually have mobile phone reception down there. So it encourages people to not sit there on their phone and actually make conversation in the, uh, in the communal area of the, of the youth hostel. And that's certainly what people were doing, and, and that made for a, a very, again, this sort of fairly timeless experience of people just swapping gentle travellers' tales and families in there, so you would get the teenagers and uh, parents and, and even grandparents. So that was, that was a lot of fun. So the next day I carried on to 
Ripon and again rolled up into Ripon about half past four five o'clock tourist office was closed again uh, I, I fear it may have closed permanently actually because I know there was talk of closing it permanently asked in a local cafe and they said well why don't you try the the weather spoons just over there right in the market square in the center uh, which I had actually stayed at before and I went in and surprise surprise another dynamic pricing bounty they had a last minute room available for 55 pounds which I thought really wasn't bad in the circumstances so I was happy to go for that and so I celebrated with uh, a fish and chips and a pint of Stella because I was very keen on making it authentic and from what I remember in the 70s certainly in East Yorkshire where I lived and in the pub that I worked in in the 70s there wasn't real ale it just wasn't a thing it was all keg bitter and lager so uh, for my celebration drink in Ripon I thought I'd better keep it authentic and have a pint of fizzy lager so the Stella had to do. It's a pity your trip didn't come via where I live in West Yorkshire because uh, I have a real problem actually buying the fish and chips because I live in a a cashless world. Well, I think all of the fish and chip shops near where I live, they insist that you pay with cash. Um, I I make no comment as to why they might do that. Some Some cynics might think there are ulterior motives for them doing that. But if you wanted a really 1970s... Uh, experience of buying fish and chips come to the Calder Valley in West Yorkshire and because you'll have to you'll have to use cash no cards no mobile phones no Apple Pay you you definitely have to pay in cash um, and they you stayed at home when you passed through York That's right. was there another day another night or was that only the three nights that you had uh, that would that was the third night and that was my last night uh, normally people stay in Pocklington which is the next town after York it's about 10-15 miles 50 miles beyond York Uh, what I could do for that was something very non-1970s I got to Pocklington and took the bus back to York with my bike because the X46 bus which is the York to Hull bus takes bikes and it goes through Pocklington and with the current flat fare scheme it was only two quid so that was a very convenient and easy way of getting me from Pocklington back to my home in York and then the next morning back from York to Pocklington to resume the ride but that wasn't really authentic because I don't think they had buses that took bikes in the 1970s. Right back to the question I promised to ask you could have made life even more authentic if you'd taken a tent with you and camped 1970s style would that have been possible do you think do you think you could have got hold of a an old canvas tent it would have weighed a many many kilograms on the bike not a a lightweight hubba hubba which comes in at 1.6 kilograms i think you probably have to quadruple that um and double it when it got wet Uh, (laughs) did you ever consider um doing the camping thing Yes, the first time I did Way of the Roses in 2010, I did camp, uh, and I camped at Morecambe and Settle and Ripon and Pocklington when I did it that time. But you didn't do that 1970s style? No, I did that 2010 style in 2010. Um, So I didn't do it this time because the saddlebag that I had wasn't really up to carrying a tent, even maybe an MSR hubba hubba, but not the tent I've got. Also, it's getting, as we know, it's getting a bit more difficult to find campsites that accept solo cycle tourers who don't want an electricity hookup and don't need a car parking space. And uh, it it seems to be getting harder to find those places. Uh, So, yeah, I did think about it, but it was a combination of thinking it's just a bit too much luggage for me to carry on on a bike that I wasn't quite sure about yet. You could have stayed at the campsite in Horton in Ribblesdale. Um, I don't know if you've stayed there in the past. It's uh, in the middle of the uh, village. Um, and I, there, are, there are no electricity hookups there. And I think the chap who runs the place, I think he probably still thinks it is the 1970s. Um, the, uh, he, he lives in this kind of uh, old-style tunnel. I think it's something like an Anderson shelter on the side of the... Uh, 
on the side of the campsite. It's a great place to stay. And um, he probably hasn't put his prices up since the 1970s either. So uh, should you ever decide to do it again, uh, camping style, then certainly devi- you've got to deviate slightly uh, away from, um, is it from Settle? I can't remember. Yes. Yeah. Uh, y- yes, so you'll go, it'll be north of Settle, won't it? Uh, so you'd have to go from because you go from Ostwick via Helwith Bridge and then turn near Helwith Bridge and turn right to go south to Settle, but you'd go yeah. north from there up to Horton, which is only about a mile further on. So yeah, it would yeah, I think that's certainly the the closest I've come to 1970s camping um, in in Yorkshire anyway. Um, right, it's getting a, a little bit sunnier outside because earlier it was throwing it down. So we're going to go for a short cycle, I think, and then. We'll come back to the 1970s cycling and hear Rob's opinions as to which wins out, the 1970s or 2024, in a few moments. We've come out of cycle heaven and we've cycled past the race course in York and we've now arrived at the uh, famous A64 road that you can hear in the distance, but we can also see above us the globe of a, uh, well, I think it's the sun. Um, Rob, can you explain all? So we're on the Transpennine Trail, uh, just at the southern edge of York, and we're on NCN 65, National Cycle Network Route 65, and this part of NCN 65 is a model of the solar system. So we're standing at the start, just underneath the sun, which is about five metres above our heads, and there's a large golden steel sphere, about the size of a jacuzzi maybe, and that's the model of the sun. And to scale, we've got all the eight planets and Pluto going due south from us on this dead straight old rail trail, which is paved all the way to Selby, about 12 miles away. And the amazing thing about this is it gives you a feeling for the emptiness of space. So if we go about 50 metres up there, we'll find Mercury, which is the size of a pea, and then we'll go another 50 metres or so and find Venus, which is about the size of a cherry tomato, and so on. And you can see just how much space there is, even in the solar system. You don't strike me as a jacuzzi kind of person, but I'll take your word for it. And it is an accurate scale, both in terms of the distances and in terms of the size of the planets and the sun. Is that, are they all accurate? That's right. So I think it's something like 600 million to one. The scale basically means that if you're cycling at one mile an hour, you're cycling the speed of light. So again, that gives you a feeling of just how fast you would have to go, even to get to Pluto never mind to get to the next star, the nearest star is Proxima Centauri, which I think on this scale would be in Johannesburg or something like that. Uh, and that's, you know, cycling at many times the speed of light, cycling at Star Trek warp speeds. So, should we do a trail of the solar system? Yeah, yeah, and um, although the, if I remember rightly from my A-level physics, the, uh, the universe is expanding, but I'm assuming that Going back to our 1970s theme, the distances haven't changed very significant, very significantly in the intervening 45, 50 years. Well, you'd need an astronomer for that. Uh, a good place to go might be the astronomy department of York University, which actually has its own separate solar system model that runs through the campus, and that's fun to visit as well. But it was York University's astronomers who set up this trail in the first place. It was a millennium project and uh, they were very careful to get all the distances right and there's various monuments along the way that make it a very interesting and fun route to cycle. The sun itself, they were delighted to find, was exactly the same dimensions, this scale model of it. As a jacuzzi? (laughs) Well actually as as standard factory um, uh, containers for pressurised liquids. So they just took the two hemispherical ends of this standard off-the-shelf factory container, 
put the two hemispheres together to make the sun and they got themselves a bargain price scale model of the sun. And you were saying when we were cycling down here that actually it, it follows the old mainline route, the east coast mainline route, that they had to deviate uh, not because of beaching but because of uh, the coal mines in the 80s? That's right, so this wasn't a beaching casualty. It's the old east coast main line, the London to Edinburgh main line. So Mallard came along here, the famous steam engine that broke the world record in the 70-odd uh, years ago uh, or more. And this was the east coast main line, but at, in the 80s there was potential mining subsidence from new mines being developed in the Selby region around here. So they diverted the train line and this was turned into a rail trail by Sustrans and lots of fantastic volunteers who in the 90s came and cleared it all out and, and levelled it to give us this lovely cycle track that we have today. So coal isn't that bad after all? <laughs> well, uh, the, the mines have long since closed. OK, well, uh, we'll go south, I think, yep. um, in the direction of Selby um, and uh, hopefully to a, a quieter spot where we can finish up our conversation about 1970s and decide whether... You were better off in the 1970s or in 2024 when it comes to cycling long distances. We've escaped the A64, although I can just about hear it in the distance. And we've got as far as Jupiter, which is how many million miles from the sun? Oh, I've no idea, but it's about a mile on this scale. <laughs> right, OK. Um, and we've got, in fact, I'm, I'm sitting next to Judy Dench and there's a chap with a pickaxe behind us who's called... Dave Jackson. We've forgotten. We've got to look on the map. Dave Jackson. Dave Jackson. We salute you, Dave. Yeah, he's a, he was a, volun a Sustrans volunteer. Yeah, so he was one of the people that uh, built this line in the 80s, this rail trail with picks and shovels and a lot of hard graft, along with many other volunteers. OK. And um, we've, still get, we've still got to get to Uranus... Um, and we'll perhaps uh, <laughs> we'll perhaps come back to your story later, um, but we're going to pick up on the uh, 1970s thing. Now we've we've been talking obviously about you um, trying to recreate the the style of a 1970s cycle tourist, and you've got the equipment. You set off along the uh, tran not the Transpennine Trail. That's where we are now. Along the Yorkshire Way of the, Roses. the Way of the Roses. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. It's glad that, I'm glad that somebody knows what they're talking about. The Way of the Roses from Morecambe over to uh, Bridlington, I think it finishes. Um, now, um, overall, in fact, let's go through the, the different things, the different aspects of travelling in the 1970s and the 19... What are we now? The 2020s? Yes, we are, the 2020s. Um, let's start off with the bike. How would you rate 1970s bikes compared to now? Basically, really good. If you have a, a decent 1970s bike that's still in good nick, it will be a lovely ride. Those old steel Reynolds 531 frames are still just pliable and flexible and forgiving. Those old Brooks saddles, like on my bike, you can sit on them all day and they're still as, as comfy as the first mile. So in terms of riding the bike... It wasn't just good considering it was 50 years old. It was just a lovely bike to ride. Some of the things were worse. We mentioned lights. The technology certainly got much better uh, since then. Some of the technology like GPS, of course, yeah, that's just so handy now. As well as all the things like if you're abroad, you can use Google Translate and all that kind of thing. So there are many, many things that have got better. I think some of the things that have got worse, the level of traffic has doubled since the 70s and... Yeah, that, that's really noticeable. I remember some of the roads that I cycled on in the 70s and early 80s that you wouldn't dream of doing now because they're just like motorways. Sometimes it feels the size of cars has doubled as well and that, that can be a problem. I think you notice that as well, particularly on little country lanes. Other things that have got a bit more challenging, finding a campsite like we were talking about earlier. But then on the other hand, there are so many things that the internet has enabled. There are so many new ways of finding places to stay. Warm showers, which I know you've talked about many times on the podcast. Um, Airbnb, uh, this wonderful thing in the Netherlands called Vrienden op de Fiets. 
all these peer-to-peer -peer hospitality networks that the internet has enabled and they can make cycling cycle touring a, a joy so yeah there's a lot of extra options as well things like youth hostels there's a lot fewer youth hostels than there used to be but the ones that are still around I think are more welcoming places than than they were in the 70s you don't have to do tasks anymore uh, they don't lock you out of, of uh, the place in the afternoons cafes I think the cafe menus have got more imaginative the food's better now I mean, of course, cafes are wonderful places to sit out the rain in the 70s, but I think they have got a bit better. Pubs have certainly got better. Uh, they shut in the afternoon in the 70s. They are often full of smoke. They often weren't very family-friendly places then. And, and generally speaking, the, the standard of, of food, the standard of the welcome, the standard of the drinks has got better. So in many ways, I think cycle touring is, is just a, a, a more attractive proposition now, even given the, the slight disadvantages of traffic. The people, and of course the, the people stay the same almost everywhere you go. Almost everybody wants to help you and just uh, uh, and and be uh, kind and and pleasant and and I think you know there's, often there's a talk of a golden age of cycling and people talk about the 1890s or the 1920s or the post-war years in Britain as as golden ages of cycling. But for me, the golden age is now. And that was something I think that my 1970s trip certainly impressed on me, that really all the stuff about the bike and the technology, that's all secondary. The main thing is just getting out on your bike and going. And I think there's never been a better time to go cycle touring because this is the only time we've got. Yeah. If you had to choose another decade, bearing in mind the bike was invented in... 18... 1880s is, is sort of the, 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 the modern diamond frame bike. So if you had to... 1870s maybe, yeah. If you had to choose a decade between, say, the 1880s, 1890s and now, apart from, you know, big caveat, let's discount anything in the 21st century, um, what do you think would be the most interesting? Not perhaps the most... Um, the best, but what do you think would be the most interesting decade to replicate in terms of cycle touring apart from the 1970s that you've already done and what aspects of cycle touring would you have to kind of think carefully about to recreate if you put me in a time machine and said you can do the way of the roses again but in in any decade then i would probably say that kind of pre-lapsarian 1900s the edwardian era just because there's so much interesting stuff happening there socially uh, i think that to a modern rider would have the most striking differences and the most illuminating experiences and the emptiest roads <laughs> yeah i would i would have thought yeah i was thinking you know the sheer lack of traffic um i did see something on social media yesterday I think it was somebody had posted three pictures of mobile phones 20-30 years ago and mobile phones today and the fact that they got tiny uh, there was something else that had got real oh a laptop computer that had gone from this kind of uh, almost like a breeze block into something that is basically paper thin but then the third comparison was a car it was a BMW from 30-40 years ago to a BMW now which for some bizarre reason has got phenomenally bigger um, and obviously the impact that that has had as well as the number of them on the road is it, it, it doesn't quite blight cycle touring but it is a concern which is probably unique to the last 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah and uh, particularly among down those narrow little country lanes some drivers do tend to barrel along and many cars now occupy the entire width of the road and I don't remember it being quite so challenging in the 70s down those country lanes either for the uh, size of the vehicle or the amount of traffic. Mm. Do you think it's fair to say that I think you know if you go to the Netherlands for example a lot of people they I think it's a an assumption that car drivers tend to be very accommodating to cyclists because most of them are cyclists. Back in the 70s, 
were there more cyclists about to 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 be concerned about do you think do you, do you think more people are back in the 70s related to the life and the experiences of a cyclist not necessarily a touring cyclist but somebody who simply used a bike on the roads and do you think that's a dwindling number of people nowadays i don't remember there being many people on bikes certainly not touring bikes there were more people in hull where i grew up cycling to work certainly that sort of short mile or two between house and factory but you were a slightly odd sight on the road so i don't think it's that people were used to cycling i i suspect i mean there's a phd here for somebody but i suspect it's a long-term change in driver psychology fueled by having the last 50 years of adverts on tv that that always sell you this illusion of control and the bigger your car the, the the more powerful you are and and you buy these cars because cars always are going fast on on alpine roads in italy with without another car in sight and the reality is cars are usually being driven on a wet friday afternoon in wolverhampton uh, in a traffic jam and apologies for the people who live in wolverhampton nothing against wolverhampton um but the reality uh, is often very different from the image that we're sold at. And I suspect it's it's something to do with that. Mainly, this is an Anglophone experience. People in Australia say the same. People in the US say the same. Uh, I was just in Denmark doing an end-to-end, and the driver behaviour there was impeccable, basically. They would always be stopping to... Uh, let you cross there's there's good infrastructure which has cycle priority on cycle paths at junctions but also the courtesy and consideration that you'd get from all motorists everywhere was very good and and that felt a very different experience to that of britain which is a nice segue just to talk in briefly about your recent end-to-ends. You've mentioned the Denmark one there. Uh, there's another couple that you've done recently, and there's one coming up next week. Um, of the three that you've done recently, I think, remind us which country? Uh, there's Latvia, which I did in the summer last year. It's very nice, very quiet, very flat, very green. Uh, quite a lot of remote country roads and tiny little villages. Uh, I then did the Netherlands earlier this year, which, as you can imagine, in terms of infrastructure, was fantastic. Uh, Virtually the entire route from Maastricht down in the south to Groningen, up in the north and up to the coast, virtually all of it was on segregated, smooth, wide, delightful uh, infrastructure for bikes. Uh, So that was fabulous. Then I did Luxembourg. Worth investigating certainly if you've never been to Luxembourg some really good cycle routes uh, traffic free wide tarmac plenty of lovely scenery especially in the Ardennes uh, and it's not very far you, you could do it in a day but I spent three days doing it uh, then Denmark which we did from uh, Flensburg on the German border up to Skagen at the far north so all up Jutland at the Jutland Peninsula delightful uh, very rural, excellent cycle infrastructure, friendly people, nice cafes. That was a, a, a very enjoyable experience. And the next one, which I'll be starting next week, is Switzerland, which will be very different from Denmark. Uh, quite a few alpine passes, some hideously expensive accommodation, but then you're coming with scenery that's probably worth the money so uh, I'll be looking forward to that and we're doing that from west to east some people might think actually doing an end-to-end is a bit of a gimmick um, and I say that in the nicest possible way um, but actually having I've never done an end-to-end in this in the way that you've done them I've never, never found the the northernmost point or the easternmost point and and headed for the opposite point on the compass but I have crossed entire countries the Netherlands back in 2022, Italy back in 2010, in effect France at least once, perhaps twice, three times, uh, and Spain, Germany likewise, long distance routes. And I think the nice thing about when you cross a country is that you see the whole thing on a bike. It's not like driving across a country, 
because you don't have the time to reflect upon what you're seeing or just basically to stare at what you can see when you're in a car. Obviously, when you fly to a city or a honeypot tourist destination, you see that particular place, but you don't see everything else. You don't see the suburbs, you don't see the housing estates, you don't see the the less attractive bits as well as the very attractive bits. And I think it's a really... I can't think of a better way to actually get to know a country. And that's the positive side. On the depressing side, I always find it a bit sad when I come back to Britain, which is obviously the country I know best because that's where I'm from and where I live. Um, there are certain countries, I would say most countries in Europe, where I cycle across them. Germany is a fantastic example, the Netherlands likewise, but also France and, to a certain extent, Spain, where you don't see such levels of deprivation that you see here in Britain. And I think, um, is that something that you've experienced? Do you come away from these end-to-ends thinking, God, you know, what is it that these countries have done to have a society or to build a society which, from the perspective of the saddle, going from one end to the other, seems a lot more, a lot less divided in terms of affluence and the quality of people's lives? I think, unfortunately, I have to agree with you. Uh, I've, I've seen some very run-down and struggling areas of all sorts of countries the, the feeling is it's more so in Britain and certainly if you if, if one did a ride from the home counties from uh, Godalming or Weybridge or Chertsey or somewhere like that up to uh, one of the more challenged northern coastal towns you would see a huge variation in, uh, in, in standard of living in life opportunities and so on and, and to get back to the sort of the original point yeah absolutely the the buzz of doing an end-to-end for me is seeing the totality of a country. Yes, on the one hand, it's an arbitrary sort of thing. You just have a point on one side and a point on the other and you work out a route between them that goes to some nice places and perhaps some dull places. But I very much enjoy seeing all those aspects of a country, stopping at the humdrum little garrison towns or industrial uh, cities and going into a very ordinary bar or cafe and just getting chatting to somebody. And they say, well, wh- wh- why have you come here? This is, this is just an ordinary Polish town. Well, exactly, that's the point. I, I, I like seeing what life is like for most people, as well as what life is like in the tourist attractions and the honeypots and the picture postcard villages and so on. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you there. I, I, I do think it is a... If you want to get to know a country, get on your bike head to the top of that country or the bottom of the country or the east or the west and cycle across it and you'll really begin to appreciate what it is. I think the, when, I, when I did that with Italy back in 2010, I came back home with a completely different impression of the impression I'd had of Italy up until that point, simply because I'd only ever visited, I'd flown in and visited Venice, Rome, Milan, but then to actually cross the entire country for me, it was a tra- it was almost, it was a different place. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing I'm very aware of going through this range of, of European and other countries is how much immigration is a global issue, and uh, we we shouldn't run away with the idea that immigration is a, a, a an issue that only affects Britain you go around Germany or Denmark or Italy or Spain and you see a lot of people on the move for all sorts of reasons. So that's, uh, that, that's the way the world is now. Yeah, interesting. So um, if people want to find out more about your 1970s experience, if you're a member of Cycling UK, you've probably already seen the article in Cycle magazine. Um, if you're not a member of Cycling UK, then join up costs you three pounds a month that's what i pay and i get a fantastic magazine once every two months um uh so you can certainly read uh rob's article in cycle magazine um but your own website obviously has information about the end to ends as well 
Uh, yes, and all, all the various rides I do around Yorkshire and various other crazy rides like going from Britain's highest pub to Britain's lowest pub and Britain's smallest church to Britain's biggest church and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, so the website is e2e.bike. That's e figure 2 e dot bike. And of course you could actually hear lots of your music including the uh, including the music that's uh, about to appear in a couple of minutes at the end of this podcast but you you've got quite a few bits of music on on the website as well. Uh, yes, it's all there somewhere. It's uh, under the writings section and you can find links to all the pieces of music which were all inspired by places that I've cycled to so uh, you can read all about the trip that produced the music as well. But we've got to finish with Uranus. <laughs> We're at Saturn. Um, tell me about Uranus. So, uh, Uranus was discovered by William Herschel, the uh, German born astronomer in Bath in uh, 1700s, 1781, I think. And uh, he originally wanted to call it George after the king, but he decided to call it a different name and I can just imagine all his pals in the pub in Bath saying uh, so George so so Bill um, what are you going to call that planet what you discovered and so I have decided to call it George George is that his right George now don't don't get me wrong Bill you discovered it you name it but George it's not not very classical is it you got Mars, you got Venus, you got Mercury, you got Jupiter, Saturn, and then George. Don't don't quite work, does it? Can he can he come up with something a bit more classical? Very well, I shall call it Uranus. <coughs> You're gonna call it Uranus, George? Yes. What's so funny? How big is Uranus? <coughs> I don't know. It's too early to say. So why all laughing? <coughs> Can we see Uranus? <laughs> well, if you come to my back garden and look through the telescope, of course. Yeah, well, what? What's so funny? I don't understand. Why are you laughing? <laughs>